This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. High expectations after the WHO approves China's Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccine. We tell you why Africa is capable of manufacturing COVID vaccines with support of global partners. And parents of abducted students welcome their release amid concerns about a wave of kidnappings in Nigeria. Hello and welcome to Africa Live here on CGTN. I'm Mahia Mutua in Nairobi. Also coming up... Business Activity Survey reveals that Uganda's economy is rebounding. And Nigerian woman does her bit to protect the environment by turning solid waste into fashionable items. Welcome to the program. Now the Sinopharm vaccine has received the backing of the World Health Organization. That makes it the first Chinese jab to be approved for emergency use and only the sixth vaccine to get the global regulator's seal of approval. The WHO found it is nearly 80% effective against severe cases. The jab is an inactivated vaccine with easy storage requirements. So it is highly suitable for use in less developed countries. It is also the first vaccine that will carry what's called a vial monitor. That is a small sticker on the vials that changes color if the vaccine is exposed to heat. Meanwhile, several African countries have received donations of Chinese-developed vaccines. This as the continent works to vaccinate its population against the coronavirus. CGTN's Robert Nagila reports. There are four COVID-19 vaccines currently manufactured by China and approved for use. Two of these vaccines have been developed by subsidiaries of the China National Pharmaceutical Group, known as Sinopharm. A third vaccine, known as Coronavac, has been developed by biopharmaceutical company Sinovac. The fourth vaccine, approved for general use, is from CanSino Biologics. Both vaccines by Sinopharm and Sinovac are inactivated vaccines. Now, what this means is they use the killed version of the virus that causes the disease. Both can also be stored at standard refrigerator temperatures of between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius, making them ideal for the African continent. Now, to date, China has donated over 6 million vaccine doses to at least 23 African countries, among them Egypt, Morocco, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia and Senegal. So far, Morocco has received the highest number of vaccine doses from Sinopharm, 1.5 million doses and is expecting an additional order of about 43 million doses, while Egypt has received 650,000 vaccine doses from the company. Now, earlier this year, China pledged it would provide free vaccine aid to 53 countries, including 27 African nations. Back to you. Meanwhile, the African Union's Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has welcomed U.S. President Joe Biden's decision to waive intellectual property rights for COVID-19 vaccines. The Continental Health Agency says this will help boost manufacturing and encourage suppliers with extra capacity to produce vaccines. CGTN's Daniel Arapmoy reports. South Africa and India are leading efforts to have patent protections for COVID-19 vaccines temporarily waived. The two countries made the initial push for a vaccine waiver at the World Trade Organization in October last year. This after rich countries started hoarding doses of COVID-19 vaccines, leading to people in poorer countries not getting the vaccines. In a sharp reversal of the U.S. position, Washington has offered its support to the waiving of intellectual property rights for COVID-19 vaccines. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has welcomed President Joe Biden's calls for a vaccine waiver. As a country, we want to manufacture vaccines locally against this pandemic and future pandemics. It is for this reason that South Africa and India proposed the TRIPS waiver at the World Trade Organization to enable manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines in developing countries. 
The Africa CDC says countries on the continent can produce at least 40 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines using the Pasteur Institute facility in Senegal. But they still need partnerships to achieve the goal of manufacturing doses on the continent. We need partnerships to enable us to, uh, uh, on our own, of course, we will be challenged and it takes for a, a lot of time for us to get to where we need to be. But with the right partnerships, we can get there. I mean, if we build partnerships around the Pasteur's Institute in Senegal. The World Health Organization Africa Region Office wants to see a quick conclusion of negotiations so that there is increased manufacturing and rollout of the vaccines. I'd like to add my voice in praising the United States' decision to support a temporary waiver on patent protections for COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, which could mark a game changer for Africa, unlocking millions more doses and saving countless more lives. Africa, a continent of 1.3 billion people, has struggled to vaccinate its population. The continent is now exploring all options to mitigate the impact of the global vaccine supply shortage. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Meanwhile, in Tunisia, a nationwide lockdown will start this Sunday to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. The restrictions will remain in place until the 16th of May. Adnan Shawashi has the details. Prime Minister Hisham Shishi says the lockdown is meant to safeguard the health of Tunisians and curb the spread of the coronavirus. Mishishi says Tunisia has recorded more COVID-19 infections and deaths recently. He warned that some doctors in the country are on the verge of sinking into depression and the health system is risking collapse due to the strain caused by the pandemic. These seven days will be decisive. Everything will change during the general lockdown. Our freedom as citizens will be limited as well as the right to work and movement economic activities will be affected. Only vital services will continue. We want to save lives and save the health system from collapse. It's our top priority. All Tunisians must make sacrifices. The government imposed a curfew from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. and banned intercity travel except for urgent cases. The COVID-19 task force also suspended cultural and sporting events, as well as private and public gatherings. All places of worship and all daily and weekly markets and supermarkets will be closed for seven days. The general health confinement affects all sectors. The return to normal life will depend on the spread of the pandemic. The new measures will have to be strictly observed. All Tunisians must comply with the general lockdown regulations. Health Minister Fawzi Mahdi said the health situation in the country is dangerous as authorities are facing growing demand for intensive care unit beds and oxygen. The health system has reached its limit. It's the peak of the spread of the virus and deaths. All medical and paramedical teams are exhausted. The general lockdown is the last chance to curb the rate of infections. The scientific committee announced that all preventive measures and mandatory quarantine of persons arriving from abroad will be maintained. More than 10,000 policemen will be deployed to penalize coronavirus guideline violators. The Prime Ministry and the COVID-19 Task Force have announced that the health situation in the country is very dangerous. The health department has called on Tunisians to respect social distancing and to register on the national vaccination platform, evax.tn. CGTN, Tunis. Well, let's take you back to our top story where the Sinopharm vaccine has received the backing of the World Health Organization, making it the first Chinese jab to be approved for emergency use and only the sixth vaccine to get the global regulator's seal of, of approval. It va differs from some of the other coronavirus vaccines currently in use. It is the first inactivated virus vaccine to receive WHO approval. A key advantage is that it can be stored in a standard refrigerator at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius, while some other vaccines require ultra-cold temperatures, so it is easier to transport and store. It is also the first vaccine that will carry what's called a vial monitor. That's a small sticker on the vaccine vial that changes color as the vaccine is exposed to heat, letting health workers know whether or not it's safe to use. 
Well, let's discuss this further now with Dr. Diki Akanmori, who is the Africa Regional Advisor for Vaccine Research and Regulation at the WHO in Congo, Brazzaville. He joins us via Skype now. Uh, doctor, what is the significance of the WHO's approval of Sinopharm's COVID-19 vaccine? Thank you very much, Mahi. I mean, this is, this is uh, thank you for having me. I mean, this is a huge leap because we have an additional vaccine and it means an additional source of vaccines that potentially could also um, help the continent so that access can improve and we can have many more people uh, vaccinated uh, against this disease. But let me also quickly add that I think the world has been most, most fortunate for the first time in research and development where you have so many different types of vaccines, as you mentioned, uh, this is um, a, a, an inactivated virus, and all of which uh, seem to work very well and have very good efficacy, um, you know, comparable across the board, the board, in particular efficacy against severe disease and hospitalization. This is, of course, a significant de development, Doctor, but how does Africa then and other developing regions in the world stand to benefit from the increased availability of this Sinopharm jab? Well, first of all, let me say that, you know, uh, China is already supplying vaccines uh, through bilateral arrangements um, to different countries on our continent. And remember also at the same time, the African um, uh, vaccine um, uh, acquisition task team of the African Union um, also has in mind or has uh, plans to use this vaccine as well, to have access to this vaccine, to make it available to countries in our region. So therefore, it's just an addition to the COVAX facility uh, vaccines, which are currently uh, being used across the continent. And it just adds to the number of vaccines that are, uh, will be available and access to uh, many more vaccines and hopefully uh, this will help address, you know, the current, you know, slowdown in vaccine shipments that we are observing. And uh, finally, Dr. Akanmori, the, is the push to have these COVID vaccines manufactured in Africa justified and how can this be achieved? Yes, I mean, vaccine manufacture, I didn't quite hear the question, perhaps if you could just repeat it, I didn't quite get the question, but uh, I think it's to do with vaccine manufacture. Yeah, vaccine manu manufacture certainly is the ultimate. That's, that's the ultimate goal, that there be as many manufacturing sites as possible globally, including in our region, uh, so that not only can we address, you know, in pandemics, shortages of vaccines, but that at least we can also begin to address our own uh, diseases which also need vaccines and which may not uh, be considered by other parts of the world. All right, doctor, thank you very much for your insights there. Dr. Diki Akanmori, who is the Africa Regional Advisor for Vaccine Research and Regulation, joining us live there from the WHO in Congo, Brazzaville. Moving on, Niger's government has stepped up efforts to raise awareness about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. And as CGTN's Jin Keo reports, the initiative also aims to spur interest in COVID-19 vaccinations. To popularize the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, this caravan is set to visit all eight regions in Niger. During the launch, local authorities and development partners visited five coronavirus vaccination sites, including Niamey's General Referral Hospital. The facility was financed and built by the Chinese government. We have significant amounts of Sinopharm and AstraZeneca vaccine available to all vaccination sites. We therefore ask the population to come and be vaccinated. When these quantities of vaccine are used up, we will place new orders so that the entire population is vaccinated so that we can create collective immunity. Officials emphasized the importance of people getting COVID-19 vaccines and sought to instill more confidence in the process by being inoculated. It is necessary that the populations adhere to the vaccination caravan 
because the vaccination strategy is effective. The virus attacks all types of people. It does not attack people according to their age, their origin, or their nationality. It is true that younger people are less exposed, but we see that this is not the case with the variant of the virus. It is by being vaccinated that we can defeat the virus. As we all know, we need to reach at least a 60% vaccination coverage to talk about collective immunity, and those who are vaccinated are less exposed to the virus. Niger has received about 400,000 doses of the Chinese Sinopharm vaccine and around 350,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca jab. The country hopes to exhaust this stock of vaccines by the 15th of May before embarking on the next phase of vaccinations. Vaccination is very important because it's part of the strategies to control COVID-19. We have seen that in most countries, when vaccination is combined with barrier measures, we can achieve good results. So we are encouraging everyone in Niger to get vaccinated. We don't have enough doses of vaccines, but we hope to finish this step quickly so we can get new doses and continue the vaccination. About 10,000 people living in the Niamey region have already been vaccinated. Jin Keo, CGTN. South African health officials are awaiting test results to determine if crew members on board an Indian cargo ship may be carrying a highly infectious and immune-evading new variant of COVID-19. The triple mutant strain first detected in India caused a rapid spike in infections and placed the subcontinent at the epicenter of the global pandemic. The ship has been placed on lockdown and crew members are quarantined on board the vessel. CGTN's Julie Shire now reports. Authorities have been quiet on the condition of crew members on board the Indian cargo ship since it docked at the port of Durban in South Africa. One crew member reportedly died of a heart attack, while 14 others have been quarantined since testing positive for COVID-19 on arrival. The most important thing we must do is that we must ensure that the people they are quarantined, they've got food and ensure that we provide medical health care uh, systems and facilities to ensure that uh, they survive COVID. It's not clear if the team may be infected with the B1617 variant, which has caused havoc in India and sent infections soaring. Genomic testing is being carried out locally to determine the exact strain. Health Minister William Kize has confirmed the variant circulating India has yet to be detected in South Africa, but there are concerns of its impact should it reach African shores. We can't quite guarantee that even if you were to vaccinate 80% of your population, that uh, the vaccines you have administered would protect people from all possible variants. So we don't know, for example, when the variant that is now circulating in India is going to hit South Africa, what is going to happen with the, with, with the vaccine options that we have. Durban is one of the busiest ports in Africa. High volumes of cargo pass through the terminals every day making it a hotspot for COVID-19. Government has, has got a responsibility to ensure that they screen everybody. But screening is not, is not the litmus test. You know, government can not only vaccinate citizens, it must also vaccinate people that arrive in the country and come here for trade because South Africa is a major tri trade partner to many countries, especially around the Sarek region. Port authorities say the ship will not move until the 14-day quarantine is over. Crew members and cargo will remain on board until the necessary clearance is obtained. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. You're watching Africa Live on CGTN. Time for a quick break. Still ahead on the program. Parents of abducted students welcome their release amid concerns about a wave of kidnappings in Nigeria. And a Nigerian woman does her bit to protect the environment by turning solid waste into fashionable items. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN.
Welcome back. Let's take you to West Africa now, where officials in Kaduna State in northern Nigeria say 27 students kidnapped at a forestry college in March have been released. They are among the 39 who were initially captured. Ten were freed earlier, while two managed to escape. Family members were jubilant upon receiving back their loved ones. The parents' group alleged that ransom had been paid to release them. However, the Kaduna state governor, Nasir El Rufai, has been adamant that no negotiations for ransom would take place. The released students shared their ordeal in the custody of the bandits. The kind of torture, we've been tortured there and all the insults. I can never forget that in my life and all the treatments we did. Myself, I was sick. So. I fainted like three times. Staying in the country, residents of Jos in north-central Nigeria are calling on the government to adopt community policing as a way to improve security in the country. The call comes amid a spike in violence in the region, which used to be one of Nigeria's most peaceful areas. Tesem Akende reports. Three months ago, 50-year-old fashion designer Sunday Idipe was attacked. A group of boys forcefully took his phone money and other valuables the, the numbers of boys that can age of 12 13 14 came out from that flower site and I surrounded me and I asked them what were they looking for they said I should submit all my belongings I said for what they now showed me gun and knife that if I cannot cooperate any other thing can be can can fall in or what happened. This community is just one of several in Jos facing fresh security challenges. In April alone, almost 600 civilians were killed across Nigeria and at least 406 abducted by armed groups. According to analysis by the Council on Foreign Relations, the rising violence has led to calls to bolster the country's police force. The United Nations says Nigeria needs more than 150,000 more police personnel to meet the standard ratio of one policeman to 450 citizens. It says that would ensure better protection of lives and property. Nigeria has fewer than 400,000 policemen tasked with securing over 200 million citizens. In order to complement the efforts of the security personnel, residents in the Apata community have had to rely on the local vigilante unit as a form of community policing. And their efforts are welcomed by local residents. Honestly, the community policing effort is yielding results. We feel safer now. We just hope they will not relent. What the local vigilante or community police, if you like, are doing is highly commendable. I remember they resisted an attack on an innocent passerby two weeks ago. They really need to be encouraged. Security experts say the government should legalize community policing across the country. You know, this community policing, they need some sort of um, leverage. They need the law to back them up. They need Nigeria to set up a law constitutionally to back what they are doing. If not, you find out that their efforts will be in futility if they are not backed by the law. A bill to adopt community policing into the country's constitution has passed its second reading in the Senate. If approved, more citizens could participate in the prevention, detection, and resolution of crimes in their societies. Tassim Akendi, CGTN Jos, Nigeria. And still in Nigeria, COVID-19 came with disruptions and changes for everyone, but even more so for people with disabilities. Nearly 15% of the nation's 200 million strong population live with some form of disability, but the COVID-19 pandemic cut off access to care and support for many of them. CGTN's Kelechi Emekalam reports. This is 35-year-old Avishima Akiger. At first glance, one can't tell she's a person with a disability. Young and out of school in 2003, Avishima lost one of her limbs in a road accident. Life's been difficult as an amputee, and for many like her, it's been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The outbreak of this COVID has really been a challenge because moving, going out of your comfort zone has been limited. At a time that it was a total lockdown, they were not going out. So 
you know when you have a disability sometimes you just need to go out and mingle with people and have this sense of belonging but when there was a lockdown those people were not going out and they were always in those life was really really difficult despite all odds Aveshima is not giving in to self-pity. The English language graduate has perfected her catering skills and is making money from it. COVID-19 rocked the entire globe, halting activities and grounding economies. But for people with disabilities, it became harder to cope. And that's largely because many require help moving around and that was inaccessible during the lockdown. Persons with disabilities during the COVID-19, I, I will talk specifically about the deaf people. At first, you will sit at home and you'll be watching this news on TV and then you will not see a sign language interpreter. They were not carried along. So they don't know if they needed to wear masks. They don't know if they needed to wear masks or not. They don't know if they needed to do social distancing or not because there were no people there to interpret for them to know what was happening. Statistics from the International Disability Alliance show that an estimated 25 million people are living with disabilities in Nigeria. That's about 15% of a nation's population. Nigeria passed a law to protect persons with disabilities in 2019, but there's still much left to be done to close the exclusion gaps. What disability need is not sympathy but empathy. What should be done? For persons with disabilities, it's just it's an inclusive environment. When I mean inclusive, is both infrastructure, jobs, and everything. Despite the difficulties brought about by COVID-19, Aveshima and many like her are adjusting by leveraging on internet and technology, as they hope that society gives them a better chance at life. Kelechi Emekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. Health campaigners in Uganda are trying to reduce the number of people who decide to self-medicate, saying it complicates the work of doctors. Experts say apart from the risk of experiencing adverse side effects, choosing the wrong medication can cause patients to develop resistance to available treatments. CGTN's Hilary Ayasiga now reports. Patients Akanye Yuka is battling a skin rush one that developed as a side effect of a drug she used to keep HIV symptoms at bay. I bought some drugs to treat myself, but instead I got a skin rash. To remove the rash, I resorted to herbal treatment, but it has not been effective. I'm now using the cream to treat the rash. Patience is not alone. A survey conducted by doctors in one of the divisions of Entebbe municipality found 90% of people self-medicate. Health experts in Uganda say it can result in under or overdose, especially among children and expectant mothers. But the risks aren't putting people off. Two out of five people have talked to in this community say when they're unwell, they just walk into a pharmacy or drug shop and buy medicine without the doctor's prescription. This is worrying the doctors who say it is complicating treatment of some diseases. Ugandan scientists say the drugs most frequently self-medicated are anti-malarials, painkillers and antibiotics, which can lead to people developing resistance and upset the balance of microbes that are normally found in the body. If you take antibiotics unnecessarily and for a very long time, it means you are killing these bacteria that are supposed to protect you from these microorganisms that are dangerous to you. So in so doing, it means, one, you are going to expose your body to these fungi, this candida that people are so commonly known. Health activists in Uganda say during the lockdown, many patients resorted to self-medication because accessing health facilities became difficult. They are now campaigning against this trend. Self-medication is the biggest complicator of all treatments that we give. So we strongly advise patients or people when they have signs and symptoms of malaria, that at least they can come and have a test done. Campaigners say the distances people need to travel to see qualified health workers is also an issue. Local authorities are now moving to set up health units that are within the recommended five kilometer radius of every village in the hope that they can reach out to patients like patients Akanyejuka and save more people from adverse effects of self-medication. Hilara Isga, CGTN, 
Kampala, Uganda. You're watching Africa Live. Here is a quick reminder of our top stories. The Sinopharm vaccine has received the backing of the World Health Organization. That makes it the first Chinese jab to be approved for emergency use and only the sixth vaccine to get the global regulator's seal of approval. The WHO found it is nearly 80% effective against severe cases. The jab is an inactivated vaccine with easy storage requirements, so it is highly suitable for use in less developed countries. In Tunisia, a nationwide lockdown will start this Sunday to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. The restrictions will remain in place until the 16th of May. Prime Minister Hishem Meshishi says some doctors in the country are on the verge of sinking into depression and the health system is risking collapse due to the strain uh, caused by the pandemic. And officials in Kaduna State in northern Nigeria say 27 students kidnapped at a forestry college in March have been released. They are among the 39 who were initially captured. Ten were freed earlier while two had managed to escape. Family members were jubilant upon receiving back their loved ones, but security concerns remain heightened. And those are your top stories. Stay with us now as we take another short break. Here's what's coming up in the business. Business Activity Survey reveals that Uganda's economy is re rebounding. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, it's time for the latest in business. We begin in Uganda, where the economy is returning to normal. That's according to a business activity survey. The assessment done in April indicates the private sector is on a recovery path from the pandemic, with business conditions, employment and purchasing orders consistently improving. But some business people argue that the review does not reflect what's happening on the ground. CGTN's Michael Baleke has that report. Julian Samba runs this fabric and auto spare parts business in Kampala. Before the pandemic struck, Julian and her team worked on more than five cars a week. But now she says at best it's only four cars a month. We get lots of inquiries, but jobs are not coming through. But the inquiries are there, people inquire, because uh, we do some ads online and all that, yes. But business is a bit slow. Julia is among several Ugandans who are struggling to get back into business amid a pandemic. But a monthly survey of business activity suggests the Ugandan economy is registering growth, especially in the areas of agriculture, construction, industry, and the services sector. The economy is picking up. There's no question about that. We think we shall grow by the end of this uh, uh, financial three point something percent. That will be the, the rate of growth. According to the survey carried out by Stanbic Bank Uganda, an increase in customer numbers led to expansions in new orders and output at Ugandan companies. The assessment in business activity also shows that the last three consecutive months have registered a rise in employment levels, but this has come at a cost to the consumer. An increase in the cost of cement, fuel and electricity has pushed up the cost of production. That has resulted in rising price tags of goods and services, and coronavirus restrictions are continuing to have an impact on businesses. These days, when if you're not really operating, if your business is not online, it's very hard to get through to people. Yes, that. Also, the measures like for the COVID, because there's curfew, what, you'd be sure that, okay, maybe we'd work up to six or seven, but now you have to arrange prior so that you'll be able to beat the curfew hours. Julia hopes that the government will ease the lockdown restrictions. She believes this will generally improve economic activity and help her 
and many businesses break even. Michael Balekes GTN, Kampala, Uganda. Sudan has taken steps to streamline strategic commodities and stop non-essential imports months after a sharp currency devaluation. The Sudanese central bank devalued the pound in February in a bid to unify official and black market exchange rates amid worsening hard currency shortages and a crippling economic crisis. Here is Adel Mahrui with more details. After Sudan introduced an 85% devaluation of its pounds in February, the government appeared to have managed foreign currency prices. Yet in recent days, the black market began to re-emerge, with the US dollars trading at up to 400 pounds, 18 more pounds than the official rate. Moving rapidly to regain control over the forex markets, the government restricted importing non-essential goods. We have been calling for that step for years. It lifts the pressing demand on the dollar. It will also stop the flood of foreign currency to merchants, who in turn trade in dollars and create the parallel unofficial forex market. The control on imports will definitely curb that phenomenon. But not everyone is happy with the new imports restrictions, especially that the government has not announced a clear list of the banned items. To restrict imports of non-essential goods shows that the government is hesitant in its economic policy. It should be heading to a free market policy, but it takes contradictory measures. Also, we need a clear definition of what these complementary goods are. Maybe some people would consider them essential. The political instability that followed President Omar al-Bashir's ouster saw Sudan fall into a deep economic crisis. Inflation reached a phenomenal 340 percent, putting immense pressure on the African nation, which is now seeing shortages in strategic goods and essential medicines. <laughs> Sudan is turning into a 100% consuming society. We import shoes in terrible quality and clothes. That must stop. We must go back to producing these products domestically. The government should direct the dollars saved into bringing in raw material to boost manufacturing domestically. Currently, the Sudanese central bank only allows commercial banks to sell foreign currencies to customers for specific purposes. That includes travel, education fees, medical treatment or the import of goods. Moving to guarantee a steady flow of foreign currencies into the country, the Sudanese government will soon announce a list of incentives at banks to encourage remittances to enter the country through official channels. Adel Mahrui, CGTN, Cairo. To South Africa now, where the country's private sector activity expanded at its strongest rate in nine years in April. That is, as buoyant customer demand pushed new orders higher and business confidence and employment rose. As CGTN's Angelo Coppola reports, the IHS Markets Purchasing Managers Index rose to 53.7 in April from 50.3 in March, staying above the 50 level that indicates an expansion. The Purchasing Managers Index rose to 53.7 in April from 50.3 in March. That's the highest reading since March 2012. It is really a beat. I think the first thing is the South African economy has really bounced back and it's recovered very, very quickly. It isn't a full recovery yet, but when we look at other PMIs like the one done by Stellenbosch University and APSA, they're also very upbeat. And we are reaching record levels in them because people, when they are surveyed, they're looking back at the bad times and they're seeing that recovery. Well, the numbers look good. Uh, uh, you know, anything that is uh, above 50, I think it, it tells you that, no, there's some uh, activity in the market from the industrial point of view. Uh, but I think what is even more encouraging that, no, the number is actually moving towards 60. Economists explain that the sudden improvement will slow down as the country nears 2019 growth levels. Nonetheless, the improvement is welcomed. Here and there are still sectors that are really struggling, such as tourism and something, so, so, uh, new car sales, for example, uh, because of the chip shortage worldwide. But ultimately, I think for most sectors in the economy, they are back at the levels they were or very close to the levels they were before the pandemic struck. The metals and engineering sectors weren't as fortunate in the first quarter. There was improvement, but it could have been better. 
we actually at our metals engineering sector alone we are around 76 percent in terms of capacity utilization uh, within the total manufacturing sector we are around 77 percent in terms of capacity utilization so that is something encouraging but i will tell you what uh, that would have actually been much more better if there was some other issues or challenges in terms of raw material supply if were actually uh, uh, addressed uh, appropriately. There's one red flag that most economies will have to deal with sooner or later. Inflation is starting to tick upwards. We need to understand that there will be a manner of inflation coming back because the supply chain of the world is still in a bit of a hiccup phase where you will not have everything back at the same time that you need. So some goods and prices will rise. Uh, in price, but we have to be very vigilant uh, going forward, I think. All indications are that the South African economy is on the move. Everything is in place for it to take advantage of those opportunities as they present themselves. Now that just needs to happen. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Meanwhile, the South African wine industry is pinning its hopes on COVID-19 vaccines to help revive tourism in this area. The industry has been battered by lockdown restrictions and liquor bans in the last year. Sumitra Naidu has more. Wine tourism contributed over $171 million to the South African economy in 2019. This number is tripled when taking into account the indirect and induced contribution to GDP. It's become an important industry and forms a big chunk of overall tourism in the country, which is why stakeholders are feeling the impacts of COVID. We have estimated financial losses of roughly 8.5 billion rand, as well as roughly 22,000 job losses in our industry. And that stretches also way beyond just the wine industry, all the way through hospitality, events, and even the transport sector, uh, as well as manufacturing of uh, glass for the bottles and packaging. The liquor bans have been lifted and lockdown restrictions eased, but COVID remains a real threat. While domestic tourism is open, foreign arrivals to South Africa dropped by over 70%. The wine industry in South Africa is banking on the vaccination programs already underway in most European countries to see a strong rebound in overseas travelers. The rollout of the vaccine is very important for the South African wine industry. Not only does it mean a tourism can return to the Western Cape, where those all important cellar door sales to tourists uh, are so important to our producers, but also for our locals to be able to travel to our international markets where they can promote and sell their wines to agents, buyers, importers. South Africa's own rollout may take much longer. Phase one of the vaccination drive is still underway. Over 500,000 healthcare workers will need to get vaccinated before the rollout enters phase two. I think it remains to be seen how successful our vaccine rollout is going to be. Currently, South Africa is very highly um, on the list of no travel countries or with travel warnings against it. So I think um, as soon as our vaccine rollout takes effect and, and we can show that this can be done um, effectively and efficiently, we're expecting an influx of, of tourism. Since COVID-19 reached our shores, there's been three liquor bans in South Africa. The wine industry on its own lost $530 million. Exports made up for some of the losses, but the liquor bans and COVID restrictions at the ports still left a surplus of 400 million bottles of wine. At the moment, the industry is looking forward to the future. It, uh, we've just had a very successful harvest following a year of very good rains during our rainy season and our winemakers are all busy in their cellars. Wine tasting and accommodation in the Western Cape makes up the bulk of wine tourism in South Africa. This industry accounts for 34,000 direct and indirect jobs, all of which depends largely on foreign tourism, which hopefully rebounds soon as people get vaccinated here and abroad. Samisha Anadu, CGT in Johannesburg, South Africa. And taking you back to West Africa, authorities in many Nigerian cities still face a major challenge in the handling and disposal of solid waste. The country, which has a population of over 200 million people, generates an average of 42 million tons of waste annually, 
which poses environmental and health hazards. But one woman is fighting to reduce waste production by converting trash into treasure. CGTN's Kelechi Emekalam tells us how. 28-year-old Rita Idehai inspecting beautifully woven bags at her recycling hub in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Passionate about environmental care, the geoscientist turned social entrepreneur established her recycling hub called Echo Barter in 2018. She collects mainly non-biodegradable materials such as plastics and paper and creates fashion pieces from that waste. And the work we do has now moved from just um, recycling collection, collecting from households, to more of a lifestyle thing. And so right now, before you even generate waste, we have a platform where you can shop eco-friendly products. When you eventually generate waste, we make fabric from them using you know, um, local techniques. Not only is Rita helping stop environmental degradation by doing this, she's also empowering vulnerable women in the process. She has trained and employed women from camps for the eternally displaced. From a life where they depended on aid for survival, these workers now earn as much as $50 in three days. I've been benefiting from the work because I now have money to cater for my needs. I'm here to, to train. No, I was once a student. I'm really happy and I really thank God that the first 20 women I trained, they are really doing well. Since last year, I've not been buying school bags. I weave the school bag myself and I sew it. And even the children know how to do it. Children in my area too, I weave the bag and give those that cannot even afford school bags. The research Kate report on waste generation shows that Nigeria generates more than 42 million tons of solid wastes annually. This is more than half of the 62 million tons of waste that's generated in sub-Saharan Africa. Only 20% of that is easily recyclable. Environmentalists say waste collection and recycling is a promising revenue generation option that Nigeria can explore. Kilichi Emekalam, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. Thanks for staying with us here on Africa Live. Stay with us as we take another short break. Here's what's coming up in the sport. In the English Premier League, Manchester City to host Chelsea in a dress rehearsal of the UEFA Champions League final. Welcome to the 